Welcome to the Ford Bronco. The myth, the legend, the extremely tall bar stool of a vehicle that is kind of terrifying to drive fast and yet oddly entertaining. There's sun in my face. There's a giant piece of glass there. There's a small block in front of me. If I roll over and put it in a ditch, I'm gonna die. I feel alive. I feel good. I don't know. What more do you want? Main thing you have to remember about the first generation Ford Bronco is that it is good in spite of itself. As a vehicle, it is not good. It doesn't stop very well, it doesn't turn very well, it can accelerate well, and then you get up to speed and you're kind of terrified with what you're doing there. In spite of all of that, it's enjoyable as hell. <laughs> this thing is proof that icons don't always make sense on paper. As this is being filmed, Ford just launched a new Bronco and everybody's going ape for it. And you might be looking at those pictures and reading all those releases and news stories and thinking, why does everybody care? It's just a square Jeep. Well, okay. But the reason everybody's going so nuts is because this is so loved. This exact vehicle is why they're making another Bronco. They're making another Bronco because everybody has such warm feelings for this one. And the warm feelings for it are, are largely because of what it makes you feel, not because of anything it does in particular, right? It's one of those weird cultural moments where the machine's meaning stands outside what the machine actually does or is capable of. It's more about what it represents. But if I had to put money on it, I'd say that the new Bronco was gonna make old Bronco values climb even further. Let's be honest, and I mean completely honest for a moment, and maybe hurt some feelings. Broncos are kind of awful to drive. Awful might be a stretch. It's not bad, it's just that all the things that a car is supposed to do, and even some of the things that a truck is supposed to do, they're not good at. It's not really that stable on a straight line at high speed. The steering doesn't have any feel, it doesn't stop very well, it accelerates, and then once you get up to speed, you don't necessarily want to be there. And remember, I'm saying this in a nice, well-restored Bronco that does things as well as any Bronco has ever done them. If you buy one, you're probably just going to use it to run back and forth to the coffee shop or up to your summer house if you have a summer house or even just tool through the country or down some fire roads. It's perfect for that. But don't get into it expecting it to be something it's not. It feels a lot like a 60s or 70s Ford F-Series truck. It feels a lot like a lot of 60s or 70s cars that came out of Detroit. It's extremely simple. Everything is sheet steel. There is nothing like luxury in it. And if you accept all that and accept it for what it is, it's great. So in the mid-1960s, if you wanted a small off-roader, you basically went to Jeep or you went to International Harvester. International Harvester sold you the Scout, which was essentially a bunch of school bus parts in a square box. Jeep sold you the Jeep, the CJ, everybody knows what that is, a bunch of Jeep parts in a Jeep-shaped box. Ford looked at that market, saw a place they could slot in. They tooled up a special platform, stuck it halfway between the Jeep and the Scout in terms of truckiness, took a bunch of F-Series parts, stuck them underneath. The crazy thing is, the way this thing evolves is another example of GM and Ford looking at each other across town and being like, hmm. GM looked at the Bronco, said, nah, that sells, we should make one. Tooled up, eventually made the Blazer, which was a shortened version of the CK pickup they offered. Ford looked at that and thought, well, hell, we could have just made a shorter truck. I guess we should just take our truck and make it shorter. And every Bronco after this was basically just a shortened version of the F-Series pickup. What that means is that everybody wants this one, partly because it looks rad, partly because of the story, partly because it's fun to drive, and partly because it's the first one. Think of this like the off-roading world's Ford Mustang. They made a decent number of them, a lot of people modified them, and finding a good one now is rare. Now, you may look at this thing and think, oh, God, the rollovers and uh, safety and it's deadly and everybody's gonna die and they get crushed in an accident and be awful. And you're right, I mean, there's really nothing here. There's no roll cage. This isn't gonna hold you up. This isn't gonna hold you up. There's not a lot going on, but it's a cool truck. And there are a lot of neat little touches. My personal favorite, because I'm a giant nerd, is the flip-up license plate. 
When the tailgate's down, still see it from behind because it's hanging vertically. And when you put the tailgate back up, ta-da! The thing is, you don't realize until you stand next to one just how tiny they are. They're tall, but they're not wide. And that wheelbase is just 92 inches. That's six inches shorter than a modern Mini Cooper. It's just some slab sides, flat glass, and a couple of axles. There's not that much else there. At first, he only came with a straight six, a three-speed manual, and no power assist on anything. But in later years, they were available with V8s, automatic transmissions, power steering, power brakes, even air conditioning. These are simple trucks, and it's nowhere more obvious than underneath. Ford wanted these things to go out the door pretty quickly, efficiently, and to be built as cost-effectively as possible, right? So they use a lot of parts bin parts, not for worse, they just do. The stampings are simple, you look underneath it, it's a lot of straight lines and sharp edges. There's nothing wrong with any of that, it's just something you need to know, because it impacts how the trucks held up. Most of these things were bought by people who intended to use them, either every day, or in the salt or snow, or on trails, or in the sand, where you take an off-road vehicle. Where you go in a Jeep or a Scout, you would go in a Bronco. And that means two things. One, it means that water got places it probably shouldn't have gone and rusted the trucks out. These things rust everywhere. If there is an intersection of two pieces of metal, or even just one piece of metal hanging out in the breeze underside a Bronco, it is probably going to rust if you use the truck in weather, which means that when you look at one that you might want to take home, be pessimistic. If you don't see rust, there's probably some rust somewhere. The second thing is, everyone modified them. Like a lot of cars, when they got into the secondary market, they simply just got used harder than they did to begin with. People cut them up to put wide tires and fenders on them. People put big motors in them. People put different transmissions in them. They were prime for that because they were very, very good at what they do. So that brings us to the final term you need to think about when looking at a Gen 1 Bronco, and you'll hear it an awful, awful lot. The word is uncut. It refers to these fenders. Now, if you look, they, this is an uncut car. This is exactly as it left the factory. Those fenders come down very, very low, even with the suspension at full droop, which means that if you want to lift it, put wide tires on it, do all the things you do to take a truck off-road, you need to cut the sheet metal to make room for it. Once you do that, the truck's no longer original, blah, blah, blah. If you care about that, don't buy a cut Bronco. But more important, if you're looking for an uncut one, know they're more rare. Most of the trucks were cut, most of the trucks were lifted, most of the trucks were used because they're so, so good at what they do. Now, the glory of a Gen 1 Bronco is that pretty much anybody can work on it. They were built to be simple. They were built to not need a lot of special knowledge. Those are Dana axles, Dana transfer case, small block Ford or their straight six. There's not much special here. It's just simple and durable. So if you buy one, you could work on it. Garage down the street can work on it. You don't have to worry about finding somebody who knows what they're doing with it, which is pretty cool. The Bronco is a much desired off-roader with appeal across a wide range of buyers, and it's been increasing in value since 2011. An original 1966 Roadster in number two excellent condition went for about $10,800 in early 2011. As of May 2020, that truck was worth almost five times as much, $51,200. As always, values change over time, so please go to haggerty.com slash valuation tools in order to get the most detailed and up-to-date information. Now, should you buy one, right? If you're going to buy one as an investment, you probably do okay. These things have been gently climbing for a little while now. Everybody seems to agree that they come from an era that's not coming back, and they're worth having, and they're cool. Park it, do okay, maybe take it out on Sundays. You buy one to drive every day? Well, you might be missing some of the point. It's not the greatest around town car. It's not great for road trips. They're definitely better off-roaders. They're definitely better vintage off-roaders. But if you buy one because you want to tool around in it and you think you might make money, and most of all, you just love what Ford did with this. Why would you buy one of these? Well, obvious answer, it's cool. It looks great, it's fun to goof around in, it's purposeful, it's relatively durable, and it's simple. There's an odd joy in the fact that like, you look at a toaster, say, and a toaster has like three moving parts, and you look at the Bronco, and it has like, 
maybe five moving parts, and all of them can be understood at a glance by a toddler. It's a Jeep for people who don't want Jeeps and a Scout for people who don't want Scouts. I don't know. What more do you want? But are you some kind of jerk? This is America, like a Ford Bronco.